A quick warning. This episode includes discussions about complex trauma. While we don't get into specifics, we do explore how sustained severe child abuse impacts the brain and what is being done to support survivors. Listener discretion is advised. Every time I talk with Amy Bradley, I hear about some new program she's developed or a new plan she's created to help bring love and healing to people who've survived the unimaginable. She founded Hesed Place only a few years ago and has already received national attention for her trauma-informed town-within-a-town model. She's a visionary leader whose passion for hurting people has resulted in training numerous community partners how to provide trauma-informed care at their own location. Although our conversation starts with us talking about coffee, Carolina pottery mugs, and Tanzanian art, Our main conversation revolves around Amy's decision to found a nonprofit organization and help develop a unique model for helping survivors of complex trauma, one that can be replicated nationwide. I can't wait for you to meet Amy Bradley, the founder and executive director of Hesed Place in New Bern, North Carolina. And be sure to check out the show notes page where you can see photos of the artwork that we discuss in the first part of this interview. Thanks for listening. Hey, have you ever wished you could hear some good news for a change? Well, I might have just what you've been hoping for. Welcome to Your Nonprofit Life, where we remove our rose-colored glasses and explore what leaders are actually doing to move their nonprofits from messy to thriving without burning out in the process. I'm Laura Zelke, Director of Member Experience for the Nonprofit Leadership Lab. Join me each week to explore the ups, downs, and whoopsie daisies of your nonprofit life. Let's get started. So, Amy, I'm so glad to have you here today. You're my first guest from North Carolina, which is where I'm based. So, I'm, I'm good morning, my friend Laura. <laughs> <laughs> How many cups of coffee have you had so far today? I've had two cups. Uh huh. And my first cup was out of my North Carolina pottery. Okay. And my second cup was not. So I heard a rumor that you are a coffee mug snob. Is this true? Yes, I'm self-professed. I'll admit it. (laughs) Only because I really love to drink out of North Carolina pottery, but I've also made the habit of, you know, when we travel, I'll look and see if there's a pottery artist and we'll bring back a mug. And so we've tried to, you know, how all of those cups Mm -hmm. store up in your cabinet and like I've got way too many cups. So it kind of helps us a little bit. Like, is that pottery? No. Is that a special mug? Yeah. Okay. We'll keep that one anyway, but I do. I love a good North Carolina pottery mug. So yeah, it's a piece of art. It is. And you get to drink coffee out of it. So it's like a win-win. Yes. Which I do for (laughs) a half a day. A half a day. Like you're that disciplined half a a day. day. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and probably the first half of the day, right. Just to get it started. Right. Right. And so then I just hydrate late at night and have to pee all night long. You know <laughs> Exactly. I mean, you know, this is the life of a nonprofit leader. That's right. <laughs> Caffeinate in the morning, hydrate at night. Yeah. yeah. So I have a question in behind you, you have some beautiful artwork of lions. And I was wondering, could we maybe put that on the show notes page so people could see those? Yeah. So they look really unique. So these are actually original pieces of art that I brought back from Tanzania. I've been to Tanzania four times to do some work there over the last 10 years and worked with people who were trauma survivors there as well. And I am struck by the lion. And one of my trips found the first lion, which... I bought him, I brought him back and I framed him. And then when I went back a few years later at the same vendor by the same artist, I found the other lion. And most people don't know this, but they are behind my head. And I don't typically sit at my desk for session work, but I do have a personal feeling about each picture. And I call each picture something different. And they're facing the direction that they are for a reason as well. Hmm. So I'm sitting in our session room, actually, at Hasad Place. But the one that's facing the sofa where most of our folks will sit when they're doing their counseling, I call that one compassion. 
And then I actually have the one over here that's facing the door and I call it Defender. So I just love the feeling that comes with each piece of art. And these two have really struck me. And I think that the feeling that comes with each painting goes along with some of what I feel for what I do Mm -hmm. in my work. The passion and the strength. Yes. And that there are situations in which there is a need to defend those who need help Mm -hmm. to be defended and that we should have compassion in every circumstance. Yeah. So that's just like the perfect little segue into asking you, could you tell us a little bit about Hased Place and what you do? Yes. So Hased Place exists to provide services for complex trauma survivors which in short term will be adult survivors of typically severe childhood abuse. So for the little ones who have grown up and developed through severely abusive situations, it really actually changes the brain and the child who survives and grows up into an adult who in a lot of ways typically will bump up against many, many struggles when it comes to even just being functional or productive in life. We're here to help those people. Yeah, I was just interviewing someone earlier this morning who runs a child protection advocacy organization. Well, she's the development director there, and they're so concerned right now with kids being at home. And the first line of responders not really seeing the kids, you know, like on the school bus or whatever. So sometimes kids are rescued out of those situations and placed into foster care or they're just relocated with other family or something like that. Are those also people that you help or is it just people who are never rescued out of that environment? They just grow up there and then go into adulthood. Yes, those are also people that we help. Uh You know, there's traditionally going to be statistics about pretty much any need or population of people, right? Mm -hmm. I find that because so many of the adults that we help were never identified early with a need, it's missed. It's under our noses. Mm -hmm. It's in prominent families. It's in families that show up as really kind and functional and progressive in life and things like that. It was within organizations, even churches and things that you wouldn't think that's where this is happening. Mm -hmm. So for the adults who, first of all, might have been missed, they grew up and that wasn't identified, or there was very much a planned or organized systematic abuse where it's really part of a network, those folks that we see. And then also, even for children that are put in foster care or they have some assistance, there's already been a period of trauma and -hmm. what that looks like. And then you've got the attachment trauma around being placed away from their parents because even in abusive relationships, there's definitely the attachment bond that has formed in whatever way it's formed. Mm -hmm. So there are a really diverse span of the folks that we serve. And it really looks like, what does it look like to have to survive severe sustained abuse? Mm -hmm. And when you talk about abuse, is it always physical abuse? No, but typically with this level of abuse, you're Mm -hmm. going to have a compilation of abuse. And with one comes the other, you know, Mm -hmm. with the physical abuse comes the emotional abuse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you have a propensity for being on the receiving end of that physical and verbal and emotional abuse, well, you may have an increased link to something like the chance that there will be sexual abuse in addition to that. So Mm -hmm. it's really whatever comes with that. Mm -hmm. And it's more than often for the folks that we see a combination. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you. Thank you for being there and providing services. You know, I'm thinking of somebody that I met at a gas station like a year and a half ago, and I wanted to help her. And it was so far out of what I was able to even fathom how to help her that I just ended up having to step back because it was so outside of my abilities. Mm -hmm. You know, I could help maybe with money and food, but I couldn't help with the other stuff. Mm -hmm. And so to know that there's organizations out there like yours Mm -hmm. is really comforting and helpful. So like I said, thank you. 
<laughs> oh, it's listen, it's my honor and it's our honor for the team that, you know, exists within our organization. But I think that brings up a really important point because one of the principal aspects of who we are as an organization mm-hmm. is that even though we are a well-founded group of people that are hoping to serve and that we do, we provide services and even the services are well-rounded. We really see and believe and know in the importance of not being the one egg in a basket Mm -hmm. and not any one organization can do it all. And Mm -hmm. for someone who has such diverse needs and who has been through such a sustained period of trauma, there's going to be a diverse need of resources, a diverse need of intervention and time allowed to kind of redevelop and sort Mm -hmm. through and heal through that. And so part of what our model looks like is to not just be the one egg in the basket, but to also involve the community and not reinvent the wheel. You know, there are so many of us out in the community who want to use our expertise and who are serving in really necessary fields that are involved in life, who want to be there and help people who are hurting as well. Mm -hmm. So we actually have incorporated what we call a trauma-informed town within a town model so that just like you, you said, you know, I felt like there was something I could do, but there was so much more that was needed. That was an excellent point because even we as an organization cannot meet all the needs of that whole person. Mm -hmm. Our tagline is the whole journey and that comes with a double meaning. One is the whole person and the needs of the whole person And the other is the stages of the journey. Mm -hmm. So that's really unique about what we are doing because we've developed this model that we don't believe anybody else is doing. And we've heard that from some worldwide experts, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are reaching out into the community and bringing together people, practices, and other organizations who are willing to be trained in trauma-informed care training and open up a conversation with us as part of what we do, almost like a referral hub. So Mm -hmm. while we provide services, we can also refer out to organizations or to practices or to individuals that we know have at least a trusted conversation opened up with us. They know Mm -hmm. what we do. We know what they do. And hopefully they have gone through training that we are Mm -hmm. working on developing all of the curriculum for. We've done some of that and we're going to be doing that for the years, you know, coming up. But even though we as an organization provide services, it really is important for us to look at the community model to where we say, you know, what can we offer a human being in a way that is helpful and progressive? And we're doing that as a team, really. Yeah. So if you have someone who comes to you, who are some of the partners or the people in your hub? Like, what are some examples of that? So we train five different community groups. Okay. Those five groups are the medical and therapeutic communities, law enforcement, service providers, and other professionals civic organizations and churches, and also life groups. Life groups are what we call survivor support groups. And so that's going to be, you know, the small groups of people that we make a point to try to build around a survivor of severe trauma Mm -hmm. so that they have a continuum of support really in life. So those are some of the examples as far as the groups are concerned. When you say service providers and other professionals, what are you talking about there? They might be mechanics, hair salons. Okay. If you think about an individual, any one of us. Okay. Who in life are we going to bump up against? Uh What do we need in our lives? They may be attorneys. They may be an insurance agency. Mm -hmm. You know, but every component of life is going to have a unique spin on it. If the person who's seeking out the services doesn't have really like a context in which social norms align with them, right? or if the service providers or businesses don't understand really how the behaviors and the patterns of someone who has been through that kind of trauma presents. So there's a real combustion of misunderstanding there, unless we can find really some adhesion between the two. And we want to be a part of being that adhesion. Wow. So that's something I really never considered. So for example, I could imagine a hairstylist 
and then someone who has gone through complex trauma, going in and having your hair done and being told to sit in a chair and lean back Mm -hmm. and putting yourself in such a vulnerable position. So what you're saying is like, for me, I go, I'm leaning back. I'm like, okay, do your magic. Like just wake me up when you're done. And for someone who's experienced complex trauma, when they're in that position, they're having a completely different experience in their body. That's exactly right. So that's a great way to just begin at the place of noticing, wait, the way I perceive my experience is going to be completely different from the way someone who has been traumatized. So Mm -hmm. if I were to kind of break down what that experience might be for a complex trauma survivor, it might be, first of all, I don't know this person. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a relationship with this person and they're going to be in my personal space. Mm -hmm. And if you know anything about personal space, they're actually, it's gradated Mm -hmm. and they're going to be up in that really intimate space actually Mm -hmm. with a pair of scissors Mm -hmm. or if they're electric buzzers, you know, it's that sound and that can be paired with something else. I don't need to go into the specifics of what can be correlated with being leaned back and with water running over your head, but you know, there are definitely some things that can be set off or you want to use the word triggered when it comes to not feeling as though you're in a predictable or safe situation. Mm -hmm. And when someone hasn't yet processed their trauma, that can actually result in some instability Mm -hmm. or some panic, definitely for sure, distress and tension. Then the central nervous system responds and reacts. And so that's a really good kind of segue to even take that principle of This is a very broken down example that we're talking about, but really in life, anytime we bump up against somebody who responds a certain way, the question we need to be asking ourselves is instead of what's wrong with you, what happened to you? And so that's kind of how we view relationship when it comes to understanding somebody. And we're not always going to know the answers to that, but boy, doesn't that bring in the compassion, right? How do you get the word out? So I'm just kind of focusing in on the hairstylist, just as a tangible example of how this all works out. So are you saying that you find people or people find you who are hairstylists and then they come to like a training where you teach them about trauma informed and then you tell them what salon to go to or how to, how does that all work? There's this, in fact, I have a sketch. It's actually on the wall in our bigger room out here. But early on when I had this vision, I had it in my head, you know, it just started building in my head of this trauma informed town within a town. And I literally took out a sketch pad, like, no, a legal pad. Mm -hmm. And I drew two circles. And then around it, I just started writing all Mm -hmm. of like the roles. And the little funny part of that is that as I started that, that's how I saw it in my head was like an inner circle and an outer circle. And then as I started talking to people about it, they're like, what? So you say, and I'm not in your inner circle. <laughs> like, we're going to have to finish. We're really going to have to reframe uh-huh. how this looks or whatever so that I can describe it in a different way. Cause you know, everybody on the inner circle and the outer circle is just as important, you right, know, but I basically right. was, was putting on the inner circle, the services that has said place provides directly. That's like direct right. services. And then the outer circle would be the community services. And I started writing all of that out. And then what it started to look like was those people and those practices and those groups on the outer circle, I just began to talk about it. I would go mm-hmm. to them and say, this is the idea. This is what we're wanting to do. And if there was interest, I had this running list. And as wow. we got things more planned and structured where we actually had something to offer, we would go back and we would revisit. So our initial group of eight people that came together, who, by the way, were all people that over a couple of years, I really just kind of waited. I knew what we needed and I would have these conversations and they would just kind of fall in place in a way that looked like, yeah, I think that's the person that really needs to be over this portion of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And I really wasn't stubborn about it. I just felt like it was really important that I wasn't officially recruiting them, like come Mm -hmm. do this. It needed to be something that was from their heart and part of their passion. And that's part of my passion for our team, because I feel like as important as it is for us to provide services for the folks that we serve, it is as equally important that we all continue to grow and have an opportunity to live out of who we are. 
right. and live out of our individual passions and calls. So they would come to me and over a couple of years, there were eight of us. And about a year and a half, we met in my little office and it was vision casting. It was planning and vision casting and this is what it can look like and this is what you'll do and this is what your title will be. It was kind of short term and long term. And then we all, between the eight of us, would say, okay, who are you going to go to and talk to about this? Who are Mm -hmm. you going to talk to? And it was a lot of community conversation. And then it was time to really incorporate something practical. And so we were getting our feet wet, right? Mm -hmm. And I started making calls to companies that offered trauma-informed training. And we chose one and their statement to me was, and this is all they do. They go and they train all over the country. But they said, Amy, I don't think anybody is doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And we said, we're aware of that, which is why we're really working hard to do this. That was our upfront big investment. We had them come to Newburn and train us to train. And they partnered with us in a real unique way in which we were able to kind of get our feet wet and provide some of that initial training. Then we decided that it was time really for us to start developing our own curriculum. And that's where we're at so that we can really make that refined and very specific Mm -hmm. to our cause and what we're doing in our community. Mm -hmm. And the exciting thing about this, the really exciting thing about it is that it's replicable. And so we're going to be able to do what we're doing and then pick it up and take it to other cities, which we already have interest in. Which is really incredible. And I don't think I had mentioned earlier that you are the founder of Mm -hmm. Hesed Place. Real quick, and then I want to talk about how long you've been around and all that. But what does Hesed mean? The shortest, most simplest way to say the definition around that, because literally it takes paragraphs in English to describe what hesed means in Hebrew. Okay. But my shortest answer is loving kindness. Okay. So it's a word that comes from Hebrew? Yes. So for example, the Hebrew scriptures have words like loving kindness. That's where you got that word. You know, I had never heard the word hesed. I'd never heard it. Mm -hmm. And honestly, probably seven or eight years ago, I was trying to think, okay, you know, if I'm going to go in the direction of helping the people, how I think I'm going to be helping them, Mm -hmm. what would I even call it? And I was Googling words that had something to do with love. And interestingly enough, like for the group of folks that we see, love is most often so distorted. So I can't even say that in a way that means what it's supposed to mean with that Mm -hmm. group of people. Mm -hmm. When I take the word has said, and I live that out, I am walking that out in a way that shows someone safe love Mm -hmm. or love or care or whatever we want to call it. You know, usually for somebody that's sitting in front of me, I mean, it usually sounds from me initially like, you know, I really care for you. I care about you. And then there will be the process of what does that look like? Because most of those people don't know what that means. And, you know, that is another important concept that we can all hold on to and remember and grow from is that we only know what we know until we know different. That is always true for Mm -hmm. every single one of us. And not only that, we have all been through some sort of trauma. It's only relative to ourselves. Mm -hmm. So when we can grow and understand our own journey and understand ourselves better and how do we go through our own healing process, like we are firm believers at his subplace that we should all be on those journeys. You know, what can we do to all be on that journey? Yeah, I think that's why I love your Instagram feed so much, (laughs) because you're always putting up really deep, thought provoking images that it's enough to kind of make you stop things that make you go, hmm. Mm -hmm. And apply to self. Yeah. And apply it and, and work on that. And now we have our group. Oh, you have a group. That takes that to a whole new level. So what do you mean you have a group? On our Facebook, actually, Uh we have Healing Place at Hesed. And you mentioned how our regular Instagram and Facebook feed feels Mm -hmm. and how pivotal it can be. And we Mm -hmm. hear that as well. Sometimes we get feedback that sounds like your feed (laughs) is my lifeline right now. Like we'll get therapeutic. It is. Yes. Yes. But safely so we're Mm -hmm. all in it together. right? Right. So we created a Facebook group called Healing Place at Hesed. And it's like our regular page on steroids. That's how I say it. But you know, it's all of us finding each other 
and learning more about ourselves and understanding how does trauma affect our lives relatively and how do we heal? Yeah. And I will put a link to that on the show notes page so that if anybody's interested in learning okay. more about that, they can do that. So I have a question for you. And that is, is this something that you've known your whole life that you were going to start a nonprofit? Maybe, you know, I mean, kids, do kids even know that, you know, nonprofits exist? I don't know. But like as a child, were you thinking about spending your life helping other people? Is this something you've always wanted to do? Like, how did that happen? So I promise you with all of my being that I knew zero about nonprofits until two years ago. <laughs> wow. Two years? <laughs> two years ago, because that's when I we, believe well, you. I'm sorry. Okay. Two years ago is when we got our 501c3, okay. but we were meeting for a year and a half before that. So let's say three okay, and a half years, because okay. I did have people helping me along a little bit, but I really was leaning on them, like just completely dependent. And then I found the lab and mm -hmm. the lab has been like, it's just built for me, everything I know about nonprofits. Mm -hmm. So no, I wasn't thinking as a child about being the founder or leader of a nonprofit. I will say, and this is something that has stood out to me all my life. So just to say ahead of time, all of you parents who think that you are not being heard by your children, <laughs> or if you have children in your life in any way, shape or form, and you think that they just aren't hearing you, I'm going to say something about my parents that completely changed my life. And I know that, and I just had enough wherewithal as a young teenager to actually receive it. And I think mm. that probably says something. We hope that for our kids, right? Right. But I always wanted to be a veterinarian. That's all I wanted to do. I love animals. I've always loved animals. I have them coming out of my ears and that's all I wanted to do. And I specifically remember as a young teenager, my mom and my dad sitting me down in the den and really with intent. And they said, listen, Amy, you know, we want you to be whatever you want to be. We will support you. We want you to thrive and have that choice and do great in whatever you do. We just want to kind of drop something in your bucket. My dad said, you know, you have always been a very perceptive child. He said in the most unique of ways, there would be some adult man or somebody I didn't even know. And I was just constantly turning to them and saying something like, that man is really sad. Why is that man so sad? You know, I'm so in tune to just people's kind of state. And he said, I just would like for you to think about maybe directing your life in a way that you can help people because you really just kind of created to be that way. And what do you think about considering that and at the same time, enjoy animals on the side? And, you know, I took it to heart. It made perfect sense to me. It felt right. And I went with it. I did not have any knowledge or intent of nonprofits, what that means. I actually went to school. I got a degree in psychology. But I had started off going into special ed and I changed that two years in, whole nother story in itself. But then when <laughs> I went into pre-OT and then I graduated with another BS in occupational therapy, worked as an occupational therapist until my youngest was born and I haven't been working in the profession, but I keep my licensure active, do all of my continuing ed and certifications in trauma studies dissociative disorders, attachment abuse, developmental abuse, and that kind of thing. So that I have that along with my sensory integration certification to really apply in this counseling setting, then I'm a part of it has said place. So that's like the real fast kind of yeah. shakedown of that order. But no, I knew nothing about the nonprofit world. And I'm still very early learning, but right. I'm full force ahead. So you said you've only had your 501c3 for two years. Two years. Mm -hmm. Wow. And you have this vision that you drew out and it's on your wall. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I just want to underscore that for people who don't know anything about the nonprofit sector, but they have a vision of something that they want to do. And you mm -hmm. can do research. And like you said, you know, you spent a year and a half meeting with your people and not really recruiting, but really trying to hone in on passion and a sense of purpose within them as individuals. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you have a working board 
Mm-hmm. Is that right? So yes. you're all kind of in it doing the work and continuing to move the vision forward for building this town within a town, plus yes. your services and yes. you're developing curriculum. And yes. you have a group that you started on Facebook. And now I happen to know, yeah, <laughs> and speaking engagements and presentations. And I know you just moved into a new building. Yes. And <laughs> so whatever happened, like, didn't anybody ever teach you to dream big? <laughs> you know, you I'm know, like, holy I, cow, girl. <laughs> so there's this thing, you know, I feel like it's been spoken to me for the most part in a positive way all my life. But it's the strangest thing because people who don't know each other will just at some point be like, gosh, Amy, sometimes you're just like a bulldog. (laughs) (laughs) And you know, it's something that stands out to me because that in me is just the way I feel about something that's really important and has to happen. Yeah. And I guess that's what I would say when you and I were talking a little bit when we were getting ready to record this. Mm -hmm. And you asked me, what do I want them to take away from it? I think that's it. Like if you, whether you are a leader or the recipient of services somewhere, or I mean, if you are a human being and you... Okay, wait, hold on. Just for the listeners who are wondering, you are a human being. (laughs) <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. So as you are, if you are a human being, which, which you are, I'm saying, okay, that's right. yes, so let's, you are. Th- that's the point. I just that's wanted why. to clarify that because I know there's some people out going. there. Yeah. They may be wondering. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where we're going with this. If you are a human being and if you know that something needs to happen, if there is a need, if there is a picture or a vision, or if like what I did was I kind of stood back and I'm like, what's missing here? Something Mm -hmm. is missing. And I'm seeing these people suffer around this. You know, they're so beautiful. These people are so beautiful and they've been through so much and they have so much tenacity to try and heal and they're trying to get help. And then there are these organizations and they're trying to help, but there's a gap. Where's the gap? What is the issue here? Mm -hmm. And then what does it take to fix that? And, And that's what I think our thought process needs to be. If you are a human being, (laughs) <laughs> when we see something that is a need. Now, that doesn't mean like your example earlier, Laura, where like, I knew I could do something, but I couldn't do it all. We can't do it all. I yeah. can't do it all. Right. Our organization can't do it all. But we are a group of people. And that's right. really beautiful. So yeah, even in the nonprofit world, it's not about one nonprofit against another. You know, what is it that each of us is bringing to the table? Right. I talk to the folks that sit in our receiving services and I say from the very get go, I'm like, look, this is about personal journey, including for me. You know, it's important for me to have a personal journey, for you to have it, for everybody. We are sitting on an even level chair here. And so that concept is super important for all of us because even in our nonprofit organizations, is it not true that so many times in the structure of things, there's a sense or there's a feeling of elevation for some roles versus Mm -hmm, mm others. And really that's not what's happening at all. It's that everybody comes to the table with value and an important piece of the puzzle. And that's what it looks like as well for what it means to have donors or funding for an organization. It's not just about getting money. They're like the heart behind everything Mm -hmm. that can be done. They are cared for and valued at the table of this community of human beings who come together to do something important. Mm -hmm. And it is important. And I think that one of the biggest, I guess for me, the biggest benefit that I see of an organization like yours and just the training and the vision that you have is realizing that it is a journey, that it's not just, for example, rescuing someone from human trafficking and being like, okay, you're rescued. Yay. Mm -hmm. Go be free. Because it doesn't work like that. There's so much that has to go into helping that person just even see themselves as worthy of help. Yes. And while for so many of the folks that we assist, most of them have been trafficked or exploited in some sense, Mm -hmm. but that's just a component of their story. And it's really a symptom of what's happened to them and why. And so we don't even use the word rescue ever. 
in our organization. In fact, from the very beginning, like those early mm-hmm. meetings were like, we are not here to rescue. We're here to walk with. We are mm-hmm. walking with. And that's one reason why, now I'll clarify that. I mean, there are things that we do and ways that we participate that very much look like helping at that level. Okay. But we even call our survivor support groups life groups because of that really nonverbal message that Mm. speaks life into a person. Mm -hmm. We're here to live life with you to kind of like, but it's progressive. That's that's what we're looking for for everybody. So you're very intentional. I know when I was on the board of an anti-human trafficking organization, we were very careful not to use victim. We used survivor. But what you're saying is even survivor has messages with it. And so to just, you keep saying human, this is a human and we're walking alongside this human through Mm -hmm. whatever they need to help them enjoy an abundant, healthy life. And it's not something that happens overnight. It's a journey. You know, these individuals have lived through the most horrible, unimaginable circumstances for most of the time, years or developmentally, or that was their childhood. Mm -hmm. So we, as humanity, cannot expect them to just grow up and be able to function through that the same way someone who did not go through that. Our brains are affected by that. So that piece of understanding in itself, if we can bring that to the world, Mm -hmm. where we can say, look, this is about relationship. You know, relationship is key. The relational component, I mean, even Experts in the field of complex trauma will talk about relationship being like, I think the percentage is like 90% of what happens in a therapy room. So there's a lot to understand around that. But when attachment has been affected from the get go, and someone has never had the opportunity to learn safe attachment, safe care, basic needs, you know, for those of you who have heard of Maslow's hierarchy Mm -hmm. in the bottom of the triangle basic needs, eating, sleeping, breathing, you know, basic care. A lot of that was not provided for the folks that we see. And you can't go to that higher level cognitive functioning without all of that being safe. Mm -hmm. So we're really kind of going back and providing Mm -hmm. some of those foundational levels of safety and relationship in order to build up from there. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you this. Do you have staff or are you volunteer based? We are currently all volunteer based and all of us have other endeavors or jobs in life. And so that is one thing that I hope will change Mm -hmm. in the future. But I, for all intensive purposes, work full time Mm -hmm. doing this. Mm -hmm. And then I have this wonderful team of people who, Mm -hmm. you know, work as much as they can to help. We are spinning a lot of plates all the time. Yeah. And I wonder, you know, how do you take care of your team? your volunteers who all have other jobs when you're dealing with people as your clients, if you call them clients, but you know, somebody who comes in, who's a human, who's had this complex trauma, these are pretty heavy burdens. How, you know, as far as like the mental health toll that this can take on people, how do you guys take care of your team with that? The way our team started, we started as a visionary committee and then Mm -hmm. I added a board. So it was a little flip-flopped, but the visionary committee was like the hit the ground running workers, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I knew each one of them very well. And then they began to know each other very well if they didn't already. And then some carry over with the board, but there's a little bit of a unique relationship between the two teams and also between me and the individuals. What's across the board the same? is from the very beginning, I've made it clear and we have all embraced it and learned it together how important the personal journey is. And so I have from the very beginning talked about the importance of if something feels too big or if this feels like too much to sort through Mm -hmm. or if this is something that feels like it's too much that you can take on, then these are things we need to be talking about. And we can't address that if we're not talking about that. Mm -hmm. And it is really true on those two teams of people, whether it's this COVID stuff that we're in the middle of right now Mm -hmm. is certainly presenting a challenge. And I've got some people on my team who are at home schooling young children. And Mm -hmm. there's 
just more than any of us can possibly do. Right. And we just have to adjust. So we shift responsibilities. It'll sound like between our team members, so-and-so has decided that she needs to kind of be in the background right now. Okay. So was there anything going that somebody else needs to pick up? How are you doing? Communication is very open with us like Mm -hmm. that. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's not unusual for me to get a text that just says something like, this is feeling kind of big for me right now. Yeah. So we tend to that. I am a huge believer. And like you said, the work that we do is heavy. Whether we're doing heavy work or not, I'm a huge believer in a therapeutic process being really an honor and a privilege in any one of our lives. You know, I feel like the fact that we would have a safe person that we could go to and work through Why do we feel what we feel? And does something that happened to us early in life affect how I'm responding to this now? Can I recognize when my central nervous system is on overwhelm and how can I help myself ground and relax? We need help doing that. Mm -hmm. I think every single one of us should have a therapist or a safe place to land where Mm -hmm. there's someone who can help us through that process. And so that's not uncommon either for our teens to have a safe person to talk to and know when they need to reach out. And we encourage that. Yeah. That is so important for the foundation of our organization that we have layers of support for the support people. Like we've got director of life groups to support the life groups that support the survivor. Mm -hmm. And it is absolutely key because that is hard work as well. Important work, beautiful work, but hard work. And we need help. We need help to be able to do that. Right. And I totally get that. And to know that you have that culture of self-care built Mm -hmm. into your team at the beginning like this is Mm -hmm. so important. I'm thinking about Jeremy Miller's organization up in Canada. I think it's Andrani's Light. And they teach self-care to people who help those experiencing domestic violence. So like the people that work at the domestic violence shelters, Mm -hmm. their organization goes and teaches how to prioritize self-care. And it sounds like you're doing something Mm -hmm. kind of within your culture of your volunteers and your board that you're trying to do that too, because when you're dealing with such different sensitivities that you don't know what's going to set somebody off into the reaction or something, right? We also have a lot of respect for each other Mm -hmm. about the role that we hold at the table. So we appreciate that this person comes with this gift set. It's going to be different than this gift set. Mm -hmm. And it's okay for us to grow or to intermingle those until one of our people might say, yeah, that ain't for me. I cannot do that. And then we respect that. And we say, well, how then do we provide the big picture? Because from the very beginning, I have told our teams and I have said it just this way. We want to be able to do what we are doing really well for a really long time in a really healthy way. Mm -hmm. And that starts at the foundation. And that's why we brought the organization down to even do this trauma-informed care training certification with this group of people, because like we had anybody on our team that was from someone with a lot of experience with trauma survivors to some, to not very much. And we needed to come together, even at a foundational level. Mm -hmm. How are you building in a strong way? I mean, the foundation of a house doesn't hold up, period, if it's not strong. And we don't want that strong to just feel like we're having to cope. It's kind of like what we're here for the folks that we serve. You know, if you've heard that cliche from surviving to thriving, we want to be able to thrive in what we're doing, Mm -hmm. not just make it or get burnt out or exhausted. I mean, Mm -hmm. this look, this is tiring work. Some of it is Mm -hmm. the nature of what we do in the nonprofit world. It is, but it's good work. So some of that comes with it. At the same time, we've got to find a way to do it in a healthy manner. Yeah. And like you said, for the long haul. And to me, that's part of my own personal, I guess, passion that I've discovered is helping nonprofit leaders to support the nonprofit leaders. That's my own personal thing. To stay in the game longer and get away from the burnout get away from the working yourself to death because we need you. (laughs) We need you to be taking care of yourself. That's why I'm asking these questions, right? It's Mm -hmm. not just that I'm curious. It's that I also want people to hear how important it is, especially when you're in these situations where you're dealing with trauma on a daily basis, that you do prioritize the self-care and not just, I mean, self-care for yourself 
but also as a culture within your team mm -hmm. that not only do you rely on the self-recognition of, okay, this is too big for me, or mm -hmm. I need to take a break. I need to step back a little bit now, but maybe even seeing it for each other. And like you said, and having that culture of respect that you're not judging and being like, oh, well, you know, that's mm -hmm. just lazy. I could do that. No, it's not like that. It's such a different environment and mm -hmm. of collaboration mm -hmm. versus competition. Yes. And for us to be able to say it is okay for you to need as well. Yeah. And guess what? Even when you need, it may not be expressed or done perfectly. Okay. <laughs> like right. we're all doing our best. And I mean, for me as a leader of these teams, you know, and I literally just yesterday was walking around our big new space and I'm thinking, this is driving me nuts because I need to have my people in one room. I want my people in one room because I want to have them here and I want to check on them and I want to see how they're doing and I want to do something nice for them or I want to, you know, that's what I want. And Right now, it just looks like maybe shooting back a text and say, I just want you to know that mm -hmm. what you're doing is not unnoticed. Right. Right now, we're just kind of all Staying doing the best we can. Yeah. But when you can't do what you want to do, what can you do? Exactly. That is going to go on a graphic with your name on it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what is the best way for people to get in touch with you if they want to learn more about your model? if they want to learn more about the work that you're doing in New Bern or the group that you mentioned earlier, what would be the okay. best way for people to get in touch with you? So along with everything else, we are working on a huge new website project and it is very much in the works, but we have our website, which is hasedplace.com and hased is H-E-S-E-D. So hasedplace.com. We are on social media, Facebook and Instagram. We are active daily. The mm -hmm. group is listed on the Facebook page, but that is Healing Place at, the symbol at Hased. You can find us there. And email is Hased, H-E-S-E-D at hasedplace.com. And so those are some ways to just reach out for a yeah. first contact. Okay, great. And I'll put all those links in the show notes and on the page so people can find you really easily. And thank Amy, you. I can't thank you enough. I'm so excited that I got to have this time with you. I especially enjoyed getting to meet you in person. When was that? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was pre-COVID. It seems like a year ago, but it's, it's six only been weeks like ago a, or something. I was going to say weeks, like a, couple of a months month, already? a month, month and a half maybe. Yeah. We got to meet in Greensboro when you were up here and we are night owls. Both of us yeah, we are, are night owls. <laughs> so it's no worry there. You know, it's like we made it happen. It was, yeah, <laughs> it was awesome. It was like, what, 10 o'clock at night? Down. We did shut the restaurant down, but it was, it was so midnight. nice to meet you in person. Shh, don't tell all our secrets. <laughs> <laughs> but it was great. And I just am a huge fan of everything that you're doing. You're definitely an organization to watch mm -hmm. because like you said, you've already had interest from organizations who want to replicate your model and you're working mm -hmm. on the curriculum. So you're just coming out of the chrysalis stage right now. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. exciting. Mm -hmm. And I can't wait to see what the next year holds for you. Well, Thank you. Laura, not only do I value your friendship, but just like what you were saying about how you love to support the nonprofit leaders. I mean, that is kind of like what our model looks like. You know, there are layers of support for layers of support. We all come to the table doing something really important that's from us. And so just know that you are a part, a big part of what we do. And you and the lab come up a whole lot in our team <laughs> conversations with great appreciation. And I know that every one of them knows the value that you and the lab also play in my life personally. So thank you. I'm grateful to be part of it. You know, who knew? I mean, three years ago, it didn't even exist. And Isn't that amazing? Talk about growth. I'm right? telling you, it's been a dream come true for me, which is just wild, <laughs> but I love it. When it needs to be, it will be, right? Yeah. And that's the thing, you know, Yeah, I've been kind of being prepared for this my whole life. Well, I want to say thank you again. I know I need to let you go. You and I could just sit here and talk all day, I think. <laughs> it's been an honor. Thank you for asking me. Thank you for doing the podcast with me and I will see you in the village. Okay. Bye, Laura.
Thanks for listening. To access the show notes or share feedback on this podcast and link over to our socials, visit our website at yournonprofitlife.com. That's yournonprofitlife.com. And hey, if you've enjoyed listening to this podcast, you're going to love The Village. It's our exclusive online community where we take what we're learning in the Nonprofit Leadership Lab and apply it. We take it to the next level with live Q&As, boot camps, online book clubs, and legit support from experts committed to helping you extend your nonprofit life. By the way, since we're just getting started, it would mean the world to us if you'd subscribe to the podcast and leave a great review on iTunes. The reviews will help us get the podcast in front of more people as we try to take the whole sector from messy to thriving. See you next time.